Hey y'all! Well, if you're new to my channel, normally we do vacuum tube audio gear, which looks like this. And I have a feeling you folks that were here to check out this video on the Topcon RE Super or Super D, depending on the country it's imported to, you probably know what vacuum tubes are. But we're going to shift away from this for this video, and we're going to focus on this vintage Topcon camera. Going to talk about some of the history of the company, talk about how groundbreaking this camera was, how it kind of rose to popularity, and then faded away into oblivion, and the reasons why for both. So it's a very interesting story. It's a great little camera. Not going to waste a lot of time on this intro, so let's check out this little camera. Okay, so you clicked on this video because you wanted to see about Topcon cameras. And you're thinking, why am I looking at Leotax? Well, we're going to go back a little in history on the company. It was founded in 1932 as Tokyo Kokaku, which we call it Tokyo Optical Company. And their first big contract was with the Imperial Japanese Army, where Nippon Kokaku, or Nikon, was the supplier for the Navy. The first lens they made was a little triplet, which was very common at the time. Given there was no optical coatings, the fewer air to glass surfaces caused less flare and more transmission of light. It was followed by another triplet, and then they made the Similar, which was their four-element lens. The reason they came up with the name Similar for their lens, it came from the city that it was located in, Shamaru. So they did make some special purpose lenses, mostly for the military use, until 1945. So after the war, they started making 39 millimeter screw mount lenses that were of the Leica type, because it was a very popular camera, and Leica had started much earlier, and Nikon was doing the same thing. Both of them were making lenses for Leica cameras before they ever made their own camera. And after the war, there was a lot of Japanese companies that were making Leica copies, which Leotax is one of them. And you can see it's got a Tokyo Optical Company similar 5cm lens. It's collapsible, just like an Elmar. And it looks like it's got the diaphragm right behind the front element and it's a super nice sharp little lens so they were making nice lenses for several years for Leo Tax and also just for sale to use on any of these other Leica copies or the Leica cameras themselves they also made some 4 by 5 centimeter folders they made some 35 millimeter cameras and then they really kind of got some traction when they started making TLRs or twin lens reflexes under the name Primaflex. One of the other cameras that was really a hit was this little guy, which is a 127 film. Baby Rolly was the first one to be made like this, but this is actually a much better camera than a Baby Rolly. You can see it's got top core glass. It's got a winder like a roller flex instead of a knob to wind. And it's got a super sharp lens with a really nice focus screen. It's just a joy to use. And it's probably the best camera ever made to use with 127 film. Unfortunately, most of the 127 film cameras were almost just toy cheap kind of cameras. But this one's really high quality. You see, this one's got the Sawyer's brand on it, which is what they were sold as in the U.S., but they were Primaflex sold in most of the rest of the world. So that leads us up to when they started making SLRs. And they started doing that in 1957. And this is the one that I have, which is a little bit later version. It's a Bessler branded Super D, and 
We'll talk about the early stuff and the kind of the beginning of their SLRs. At the time these were designed, there were two choices of lens mounts. There was the M42, which is what Contax and Pentacon used, and ultimately what Pentax went to. And then there was the Exacta mount. Now the Exacta cameras look like this. They had a front-mounted shutter. They had this kind of goofy little diaphragm closing mechanism made on the lens that then pushed through and actuated the shutter button after it closed the lens down. And the mount has got this little lever here. That you push in, turn the lens, and then the lens comes off. And as you can see, it has this weird little button here on the side that opens and closes the aperture. You probably see it better from the back. And as this little button operates, it opens and closes the aperture, and then this button follows through and pushes the shutter that's on the front of the camera here. So, enough about the Exacta, but that was what the original Topcon SLR used, was that lens arrangement with that little you know, external button with the shutter button on the front of the camera, and that explains why all of the top cons have the shutter button here on the front of the camera. I guess they just got used to designing the mechanisms like that with the lens actuator being over the shutter button and it continued on through the later models, which is kind of a neat feature. When you're using the camera, it's kind of nice to not be like this. You're just holding it like this, which is a more natural way of holding the camera, I think. So anyway, when they got to this RE camera, which was designed in 1963, they decided they wanted to have through the lens metering. And they did it in a really unique way. It's probably going to be really hard to see, but no, there you go, you can see it. So the way they accomplished this through the lens metering, you could see these little, you know, lines in the mirror. Well, those allow light to go through the mirror. And about 7% of the light goes through the mirror to a metering cell behind the mirror. And that's how it was able to meter through the lens. And it also meters the whole scene. It's not just center weighted, which was pretty unique. The other thing they added is they added coupling to the lenses to allow wide open metering instead of stop down metering, which is what the Spotmatics that came after it did. So... Even after Pentax had their form of metering, the Topcon was obviously a superior way of metering because you didn't have to stop the lens down to meter the scene. So if you look at the backs of these lenses, it has a coupling to the aperture that moves with the aperture ring. And then it's got this little lever over here, holds the lens open, until the shutter is about to close, it releases the lens, then the shutter opens and the shutter closes, and it's all automatic and it's an instant return mirror. So as soon as you finish taking the picture and the shutter closes, lens pops back open, you can see through the viewfinder, and you're ready to take the next picture. And this little actuator up here tells the camera what f-stop the camera is set to with the lens wide open. So this was like an expansion of the exact amount, and you had to buy their specific RE super lenses, or these RE auto top cores, so that the auto aperture and the meter would work. So, some of the other cool features this camera has is you can see the meter in the prism, and like some of the other professional cameras at the time, the prisms come off and if you look right there on the side of the prism, there's that little window, okay? If you look in the camera right there, it's kind of hard to see, there's a little window that the meter reading is visible through. And then that shows up in the viewfinder. It's also got uh, diopter you can put on the back of the prism so it'll correct for your vision because I wear glasses for distance vision 
And so it's nice to be able to have a diopter that will screw onto the back of the prism to correct the vision for my eyesight. It's a little tricky to get those to go back on and then it just snaps back on. And that's a very cool little feature. It's got a lever wind. It's got a frame counter here in the front. You can also read the meter on the top of the camera without having to look through the viewfinder. So if you have the camera on a tripod, you can see what the meter reading is and adjust the shutter speed or the aperture to get where you want to be. It's got this weird thing. I think Nikon F's did the same thing. The flash contacts are, there's one there, the other one's back there. And it's just kind of a weird deal. You have to have some little adapter thing that snaps on there. I guess they thought that was neat that you didn't have to have like a hot shoe on top of the camera, which does give it a nice clean look. I don't really care for those cameras that have the permanent hot shoe on the top of them. So for me, it really gives it a nice clean look. Again, like I said, there's the shutter button on the front. There's the self timer. So the other thing that's really cool is because the finder comes off, they had optional finders and here's the little waist level finder that'll slide in and then opens up like that there's a little mirror that pops up like that and so you can look down and it's basically like a 90 degree finder when you can't look through at eye level you can look down so if you got a really low angle on something or you can hold it over your head upside down and get a picture like over a crowd and look through this to frame the picture so that's kind of a cool thing that you can do with these that a lot of cameras that have fixed prisms you can't do that kind of stuff with so that's really cool so let's look at some of the lenses this is the 35 millimeter f 2.8 with the original hood and the hoods are really nice they have the thing that like the later cameras had where they have a bayonet mount for the hood and then you can also put the hood on backwards and store it like that when you're carrying the camera around and then of course you can take it off put it on the right way and use it I'm a big proponent of lens hoods especially on these earlier lenses that don't have you know insanely good coatings on them and then to put the lens on the camera there's no gymnastics you just line up the two red dots you twist the lens you're ready to go doesn't have all that weird rabbit ears and clicking the meter prism back and forth and all that like the Nikon's had which is one of the reasons this camera won the contract with the Navy was it beat out Nikon and all these other cameras because it was easy to use super high quality optics it's built like a tank and it didn't have all that crazy gymnastics that you have to do with a Nikon every time you mount a lens I think the army went with a Leica because they're quieter because these aren't a super quiet camera I mean they wind quietly but that's not a super quiet shutter but it's not super noisy either and it's got a very unique it winds like butter and then it's got a little pating, kind of a shutter noise, which is cool. Okay, let's look at some of the other lenses here. This is the 5.8 centimeter or 58 millimeter f1.8. This is the slower of the two lenses. They did have a 1.4, but I've got the 1.8. And from what I've read online, the 1.8s are actually a little sharper, which was very common back in the day. Those super fast lenses from you know even Nikon and Olympus and these other manufacturers the slightly slower normal lenses were usually sharper but this is just happened to be the one that came on this body that I got and I'm still looking for an original lens hood it's the only lens I have that I don't have the original hood for I've got original caps for all of them this is another lens and this one's got a very nice little flush kind of petri yellow filter which I use yellow filters with black and white film again this one has the original hood comes off like that versus goes on the lens and uh, 
100 millimeter f 2.8 it's a very nice lens for doing like portrait work it's got nice shallow depth of field this lens is crazy sharp and it's fast enough to use in almost any kind of light so this is one I carry with me a lot when I'm using this camera next we have this is the 135 f 3.5 and the nice thing too is all of these lenses, except the super wide angle ones, use a 49 millimeter filter. You only have to carry one filter size with you, which is really nice. And so, again, got the same kind of style on all these lenses. I like this look of them. This one's got a built in hood here that's like a little double, double action hood there. It's still got the original past sticker on it. And just a super nice lens. Then we have this one's got a little bit different cap. It's got the the Japanese version cap instead of top core. Anyway, this is the uh, 200 millimeter f 5.6. As you can see, the lenses are starting to get slower as they get longer. I'll explain that in a little bit. This one's got its own little actually pretty long little lens hood on it. Again, it's got the same style with the ribbed black with the silver body. The later ones had black bodies. These are the earlier lenses that were made for the RE. And then finally, and this is a fairly, fairly rare lens, but it's not super rare. I've got the original hood that uses Series 9 filters or the filter holder. And this is the 25 millimeter f3.5. It's just a beautiful piece of glass. And it's a nice compact little lens. It's crazy sharp too for a wide angle lens, especially in this lens mount. And they just did an excellent job with this. I did pass up buying a 20 millimeter f4 that they sold. And I'm kind of kicking myself for doing that, but it was really expensive and at the time I just didn't really have the money should have bought it though it was super clean and I haven't seen one since so those are pretty rare to see those super wide angles and it was the widest lens that they made but this 25 came with the original case and like I said it's got the filter holder and everything so that was a nice score so these things were made through the 1960s into the 1970s but during that time period some other kind of groundbreaking cameras came out Pentax came out with the K mount Olympus came on the scene with their super compact 35 millimeter camera and let me go up there and grab one of my OMs and show you how much smaller an OM is so as you can see the little OM1 is a much smaller little camera and it's also a lot lighter and about the same time period Olympus came out with the OM2 and then the OM2N which was an aperture priority automatic camera Canon was obviously on the scene making SLRs and they had you know their automatic cameras the AE1 and then Nikon was also automating some of their cameras and Topcon never did that. They stuck with the manual metering, manual focus. We're still talking about all manual focus cameras, but they just didn't jump on the auto metering bandwagon. And they just, they did very minor upgrades to this model. And they just kind of weren't relevant. People would come into a camera store and they're like, I can buy this camera that does the metering automatically. And I can take candid pictures and, you know, I can almost just set it on F8 and set the lens on the little mark and just use it like a point and shoot. Where these, you still had to, you know, look at the meter. The meter wasn't real huge inside them. And they were also very expensive cameras. The other problem that these had, and it was probably what really killed them off, was the lens mount that they chose was kind of an archaic at the end of its life lens mount when they adopted it. 
And the problem is, and let me show you on one of the faster lenses. So there's the size of the lens mount. And if you look at the size of the lens mount on the Olympus, look how much bigger the lens mount is. This little tiny diameter lens mount, which is only about 37 millimeters, I think, and this little tiny lens mount basically just choked the camera system to death. There was no way they could compete when Olympus and some of these other folks started making like you know, 24 millimeter f2 lenses and they were making f1.2s and they're making things like you know 85 millimeter f1.4s just wasn't possible in this lens mount and so the pro photographers dropped this camera because of that and the consumers like using what the pros are using and so when that all dried up and the navy stopped buying their cameras they basically closed up shop, and I think they closed up completely by 1980. And so, that's kind of the story on the Topcon. I mean, it was a great camera in its day. It's a really pretty camera, I think. It's built super solid. I mean, this camera is over 60 years old, and it still functions like new. Obviously, the Navy thought a lot of them, or they wouldn't have awarded them the contract. They were used in, you know, a lot of Navy ships and stuff. So I think, you know, people would come back and talk about how great they were and, you know, that were in the services and, you know, that helped their sales and stuff. But ultimately, I think the choice of going with that small exact amount and then I don't believe many of the exact lenses would even fit on the cameras. And so there wasn't a lot of use between the different models like there were with the M42 screw mount lenses. I just don't know what they were thinking. I guess they didn't want to come up with their own mount like Olympus and Nikon did. And ultimately, that's what made the company fail. So that's a little history on the company. If you ever get a chance to pick one of these up or see one for a good price somewhere, you should give one a try. Or if you don't have any of this stuff in your collection, it's kind of a cool little, you know, sideline camera model to collect. There's not a whole lot of accessories and lenses to have a fairly complete collection. And like I said, you know, I probably should have picked up that little 20 millimeter lens when I had an option to. Maybe someday in the future I'll hunt one down. But for now, I'm pretty happy with the little collection I have. And it's fun to go out and shoot with this thing every once in a while. So I think we'll wrap this video up right here. Well, I hope you enjoyed this segment on this kind of obscure camera that maybe a lot of people haven't heard of. One of the reasons I decided to showcase this little collection of Topcon stuff was... I searched on YouTube and didn't see any other videos. I think there was one with a guy from Greece speaking Greek that was the only other thing on the web about this. There are some websites about it, but I think a video format's just more fun. And hopefully you found this educational. If you ever run across one of these, especially if you're a camera collector, it's not hard to collect like what I have here. This isn't a super expensive proposition to like put together a little kit of Topcon stuff like this to add to your collection. And they're unique enough where, you know, it's kind of a little conversation thing, especially with other photographers that probably have never seen this stuff. And it's definitely an excellent camera to go out and shoot some film in. So, hope you enjoyed this segment. For you regular viewers that are here for tube gear, going to get back on that soon. Obviously, this is kind of a little diversion. For you new viewers that are new to my channel, I plan on doing a kind of history lesson camera video like this once a week or once every two weeks. So if this kind of content interests you, please subscribe to the channel so you'll be able to get notifications. There's a bell down there somewhere I think you can click to that'll ring when I get a new video. You see the camera stuff, you can go, woo, come let's watch one. So, again, this is my other passion. I feel like there is some synergy from this whole 1950s, early 1960s kind of camera gear 
and audio gear for the same time period. So hopefully my tube audio folks will enjoy watching my camera videos too. So if you are enjoying this content, like I said, please subscribe to the channel. Please like the video. Please comment below if you've got stories about Top Gun stuff or if I missed something. I mean, I've mostly focused on this little uh, Super D RE Super probably the most well-known camera from the Navy contract and just I think it was kind of the height of what they did but I may be missing something here so add in the comments help me learn stuff too so until the next video have a nice day <laughs>